Yeah, so to, to validate the Yale Food Addiction Scale, we uh, administered the scale to individuals, uh, young adolescents who varied uh, from lean to overweight, and basically put them in a functional magnetic imaging scanner and gave them chocolate milkshake, uh, let them, uh, we, could, we could basically model the reward circuitry kind of response to receipt of chocolate milkshake, anticipated receipt of chocolate milkshake, and to images of palatable foods, and basically found that Individuals who scored high on the Yale Food Addiction Scale showed uh, reduced activation in inhibitory control regions and at the same time greater activation in kind of the classic reward circuitry when they were anticipating receipt of the chocolate milkshake, which is fairly similar to what you would see with uh, kind of addictive processes in terms of when somebody is addicted to cigarettes, for example, and they see pictures of, of individuals smoking, they'll show greater activation in reward circuitry and there's some evidence of reduced activation of inhibitory control regions as well. Um, yeah, I think the Yale Food Addiction Scale is very useful to identify individuals who are exhibiting problematic eating behaviors, which occurs in overweight populations as well as individuals with eating disorders. Uh, it provides a, a different um, vantage point than other scales that exist in the field. Uh, the Power of Food Scale by Michael Lowe I think is a close cousin to it in the sense of identifying people who are really sensitive to environmental food cues, etc. Um, but I think the Yale Food Addiction Scale is really singular and, and really focusing on kind of the problematic eating behaviors that is not covered by other uh, measures out there. Um, yeah, so what, uh, what I think would be highly valuable is to use real-time functional magnetic resonance imaging feedback to basically help people learn how to modulate kind of hyper-responsivity of reward circuitry to food cues, food stimuli, um, and increase inhibitory control activation, which is very important in modulating the, the hyper-responsivity of uh, reward circuitry. Um, there's been some very uh, clever work done by Luke Stubel at Harvard. Um, it, uh, ironically, he uh, had people respond uh, it was, uh, to food stimuli as a control condition because he was really trying to help smokers stop having uh, reward circuitry hyper-responsivity to smoking cues. didn't work for the smokers, but it worked re very well for the obese individuals, and they were able, through kind of training, to really increase their inhibitory control activation, which, again, is down-regulates kind of the, the reward circuitry uh, hyper-responsivity. So I think it would be a nice compliment. Um, I would say from what I've seen out there, it's not easy to do right now. It's a fairly technically complex procedure, but uh, the value of coupling that with doing reappraisal training to, to get uh, people who uh, overeat and struggle with that. So instead of thinking of the hedonic pleasure from eating that donut or whatever, thinking about how eating that donut would kind of clog up their arteries or have other adverse kind of health consequences in the long term. So I think the combination of the two would be more effective than either independently. You know, I, I think the, over the last uh, five years, some of the more important findings that have come out with regard to obesity are really um, better characterizing a lot of the, the maintenance factors that emerge when you sort of spend a period of time overeating, that uh, when you overeat for a period of time, you get, uh, you develop hyper-responsivity, reward circuitry to food cues, so you're always craving food all the time because of this. Uh, you see a down-regulation of reward circuitry to the receipt of the food at the same time, so you're getting uh, what's akin to tolerance of drug abuse that you have to eat more and more to get the same degree of uh, ple pleasure that you did originally. Um, paired with that is a whole bunch of changes in gut peptides and hormone signaling uh, that you essentially break your homeostatic processes that normally would tell you when to eat and when to stop eating, etc. So I think that explains why, you know, most obesity treatment beyond bariatric surgery is not really effective at all because there's all these really powerful maintenance processes that keep you stuck in a period of over, or a, a habit of overeating. Um, I'm not sure if that's the most important finding, but it, to me it's... <clears throat> it explains an awful lot of, of what's, why it's so difficult to treat people with obesity. Um, yeah, I'm, there's, there's a lot of other findings that have emerged that are pretty interesting too, but I'll stop with those. <laughs> To be honest,
honest with you, I, I'm not really an expert on kind of obesity treatment. We do mostly prevention. Um, but, you know, it, from what I understand of obesity treatment, uh, especially for pediatric populations, um, family-based interventions seem to have the most promising long-term outcomes that uh, really affecting change in the food environment, uh, the foods that are stored in the home, the eating habits of the entire family, uh, getting enlisting parents to basically help as clinicians to kind of uh, increase executive control over food choices, lifestyle choices, um, even you know exercise, which is uh, an important part of the equation, is is better if you sort of can really work with parents. Uh, so I think you know having them involved very uh, intimately in terms of the change processes, setting kind of family goals as opposed to individual child goals. Is, uh, I would guess is going to be the most productive approach. Mm -hmm.